Hey, welcome everybody to the Financial Advisors Workshop. I'm your host, Brian Castle, and uh, we have a very interesting uh, interview subject today. Uh, you know, um, as we've gotten into this Financial Advisor Workshop to meet lots of new producers and different ways that people do business, you learn so many different models and so many fascinating people. We really have a, a tremendous cohort of professionals in our industry and certainly in the independent space as well. Uh, so today we're, we're going to meet a really, really interesting guy who I, I think is a, like a prototype for what our industry should be and could be, and in some cases is, but um, I think when you hear um, Mr. Rick English and how he runs his practice, you'll, you'll know what I'm, what I'm talking about. So everybody, uh, let's welcome Mr. Rick English to the Financial Advisors Workshop. Rick, welcome to the workshop. Yeah, hey, Brian, thank you. It's good to, it's good to participate. It really is. Excellent. And Rick, uh, Rick is down in Arlington, Texas, and we figured out that I'm actually this moment uh, taping with Rick um, a few blocks away over in Grapevine, Texas. So we're not mm -hmm. not too far. Normally, our headquarters is in Chicago, but I'm down here for a conference. So we're actually not too far away from each other. But anyway, I've had a, a good uh, pre-discussion with Rick about his uh, business and his practice. So Rick is with English Financial yeah, here in Arlington, Texas. And uh, now Rick comes to uh, our financial world um, in a very different fashion than many people. Many people become a trainee at a wirehouse and then they even go into pen and they do different things. So Rick, um, you, you have an MBA and you've got lots of corporate experience and you got into our business 30 years ago, but you had a whole career before you got into our business. And I thought to discuss where you've gone, it'd be good to discuss where you began. So mm -hmm. tell us okay. a little bit about a career before you were a financial advisor? Uh, well, it's pretty simple. It's a pretty, pretty short uh, resume. Actually, I got out of college and I, you know, I had aspirations of wanting to go to law school, but for whatever reason and reasons, you know, that never, uh, never developed. So I had to do it. All college graduates do is go out and get a job. <laughs> so right. I did. Uh, and that, and that, you know, brought me to the corporate world. The first company that I, that I was hired on was uh, uh, Revlon. And it was a company back then that uh, they didn't care what your degree was. They, they had other motivations and other reasons for, you know, for hiring you. And I found myself with the company five years, a uh, couple of promotions, and, and uh, I was uh, made it to the corporate offices in, in Manhattan, in New York City. So I worked there for two years, uh, learned, a, uh, learned a lot. That, that, that company back then clearly was a, a, a marketing and sales company. And um, the man that, that founded it, just, just real quick, uh, Charles Refson, he started the company. He, he was a, a, just a, a marketing genius. And, and, and a lot of the things that, that, that I use today even, and it was what I learned way back then, 40 years ago or whatever. Charles, what, what he, I mean, he started the company by, um, uh, I mean, he was broke, broke as a church mouse, and 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 uh, he would go into beauty salons back in, I guess, the 30s or yeah, the other 30s, I think. And uh, he had he was very creative, had a lot of ideas, and he would paint his fingernails a particular color. Later <laughs> on, he would he would name that color like Cadillac Red or Fire and Ice or something like that. But that's how he built a billion dollar corporation. And he went into those beauty salons and he talked her into doing putting putting some on the counter and so forth and so she would give him the order he'd run back and mix it all up and bottle it and you know package it and deliver it collect his money and by 1975 the company was doing you know a billion dollars in sales yeah in sales yeah, yeah. for yeah uh, so anyway from there uh, and I left because I I really didn't see a um, uh, the future that I wanted with the with the company and so I left voluntarily. You know, I wasn't asked to leave or forced out or anything like that. Right. And right. I went with the company. They hired me on, uh, moved moved us, uh, my wife and I, down from uh, from New York uh, back here to uh, Fort Worth. And I was with a company called Alcon. And I was there for two, two and a half years uh, running a, a little small company that, that, that they had. But uh, um, it was kind of a turnaround is what it was. And so, but I employed, you know, all the things I learned, you know, at, at, uh, uh, at the former company, you know, Revlon. And, and uh, uh, when I came, when I started the company had, had lost the prior year, 144,000. It was a small entity, 
but it, it but it was losing money. And uh, two years later, I had the sales curve going up uh, quite nicely, and we were uh, doing exactly forty cents on the dollar pre-tax profit. Nice. And uh, from from there, the my boss actually wanted to purchase the company from from Alcon, and they sold it to him. And he wanted me. He asked me to you know stay on, but uh, I mean I got along with John and everything, but. You know, I, it's, I just, I couldn't, I didn't, I just didn't see it. You know, um, sure. uh, I'm, I'm a doer, you know, I, I believe that, that you, you work hard and you get paid for that. And corporations right. don't do that. Most, most of them don't. So I left and I was uh, 30 years old and, and started a whole new career. And I was, uh, you know, in, in commercial real estate for a while. And, and uh, uh, down here in Texas, it just, it just blew up. I mean, it got horrible, horrible, horrible. Yeah. And I thought, no, 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 no. This still isn't going to do it. And and so come around 1991 is where I got into financial services. And I started okay. really with, with Zip. Uh, zero. You were maybe 37, 38? 39. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Two, not, not 30, 39, I guess. Maybe. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I started in, in the in the insurance part of it, but um, I didn't go with a uh, I wasn't with an agency. I wasn't uh, I didn't you know I didn't start out in financial services like you described yourself or, or many you know guys and gals where they start with Merrill Lynch or somebody like that. I you know I I, I just I, I guess I just didn't. And from there, I just had to continue to grow and learn and. Um, you know, apply the techniques and the strategies and the marketing things that I had had, had learned, and um, and you know, put all my stuff uh, together. I got uh, educated uh, through the American College. I did all those those courses. Uh, you know, the uh, I'm a chartered advisor in philanthropy as well as a uh, chartered financial consultant, CLU, and I've done a lot of other stuff that I don't advertise and. And I was, I was working on their master's program to the point to where I thought, you know, I really don't need this. Uh, and I focused more on my time to continue to, to build my, you know, my, my client base. The, uh, which I'm just as glad. I, I, I think that if you're going to learn uh, seriously, and I'm not making a plug for the American college, but I think if you, if you want to do the kind of things, the kind of work that I do, then that curriculum that they offer for the, uh, for the, uh, Chartered advisory, like as a uh, advisor philanthropy, as a chartered financial consultant, and in the insurance side, the CLU, that's where you're going to get your good, good groundwork, your good basis. Uh, not so much passing the CFP exam. In fact, all the coursework that that I took through American College, I could easily sit for the CFP. But, right. Uh, right. but anyway, that's that's the direction that I went. Fascinating, and and I should tell you for full disclosure, I'm also a cap chartered right. advisor. Yeah. yeah, so there are very few in America, Rick, but uh, but that just gives a sense though of where you're going. I think the, the the you know being philanthropy being a selfless act, uh, you know, and you clients on that, you know, that's clearly fiduciary. That's clearly the kind of mindset that we want in our industry. So uh, it just that it, uh, puts a huge praise on you uh, well, for your forethought and. And American College has some great stuff, so I'll, we'll put in a little plug for them. We're very close to them as well. Um, so now, you, so so you do your, your your corporate work, and you learn from Charles Redson and uh, and other roles you had in commercial real estate. You get into our business. So how did you start to build the business? How did you, you know, but you did your training? Where did you first start? What oh, kind of- one golly, believe it or not, is one twig at a time. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Um, when, when I said I started with insurance, my first license, the insurance license, I, I forgot what it's called now, but it's not like the group one that allows you to do annuities and right. health and life and all the kind of thing. I uh, specialize in uh, uh, prearranged funeral planning, where it is uh, a funeral plan is funded through insurance as okay. opposed to a funeral home trust. And I worked with independent, independently owned funeral homes. And I I sat down, which was kind of a really a prelude to the way I do things now. I mean, I would sit down with with a family in their home and we would talk about uh, if you had 
to do it today, what would you do? And I put together, I sold over uh, 5 million, I put together like $5 million worth of prearranged funeral plans, insurance funded. Um, wow. And I built an organization too. I, 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 I hired uh, people to get licensed and I taught them how to, um, how to, how to, how to be like a funeral director, not an embalmer or anything like that. I didn't get involved in that. In fact, it's really a, to me, it's kind of a depressing industry and I never did really like going in, into the back. And of course you see this autopsy. <laughs> uh, right. But right. I can tell you the great things that I did and we did for people, they were just, it's, it's humbling, but it, 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 it's, it's so satisfying because, you know, now it's all pre-arranged, pre-planned. Right. You know, the wife doesn't have to go down and pick out a casket, you know, the hardest thing to do and, yeah. and all. And, and, uh, uh, and one year, my group, I was number one in the company uh, as a, I think I, they called me a state manager. Uh, my group did over five points of the million dollars that year in funeral plans. And right. I still do it today, believe it or not. I mean, I do it to uh, the client that I mentioned to you when, before we got into it, uh, that, uh, that passed away. I had worked with him and his wife back four or five years ago and put together a, uh, a funeral plan. As a matter of fact, I'm skilled in, in, um, uh, cemetery markers and things of that nature. I have a relationship with a company just outside of town here. Uh, they actually did the marker for my mom and dad a long, long time ago. And now their, their son has been running the business, but, um, yes, I mean, I help people design, uh, their, their cemetery markers. Of course I get paid for it. You know, I get a commission, but it's just another thing that I offer that I do that I can help people with besides, you know, manage money, life insurance, long-term care, whatever, sure. you know. So you started with the funeral insurance and then where did you go from there? Then you met clients and then you expanded that mandate or did you? Yeah, I, um, um, the, one of the ways to, to fund those plans was basically like an annuity. And uh, that's when I just started getting more involved on the side uh, with, with that. And, and the reason, honestly, the reason is, that particular insurance company was family owned. They were very successful, but it's family owned. And uh, it, it it was just kind of a really, uh, you know, a go nowhere for me in turn as, as far as a, you know, a future is. And, and the amount of commission or income that you can get is just, I mean, it, it, it didn't trip my trigger, even though I did a lot of it and for a number of years, but uh, so I wanted to get more into you know, the annuity world and, and, and more of the financial world, I guess. So I started, you know, with the, the, the fixed annuities and moved on into a uh, variable. And, and a lot of that is still on the books today. In fact, uh, uh, my, a lot of my clients are in, enjoying, uh, I have a, a pretty large book of variable annuities, but I say variable because they're, I used writers, mainly income writers, and they have, mm -hmm. they have worked extremely well. Uh, you know, my clients are are very happy with, you know, I mean, they, it's like clockwork. They get that check every month. And yes. uh, one of the companies that I did a lot with is Prudential. And I was reading the other day, uh, they are well over a trillion dollar company. As a matter of fact, um, uh, my broker dealer, LPL, now with all of their, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're managing over uh, a trillion dollars, uh, right. you know, in assets. But at any rate, um, yeah, that's that's where it started, and it just it just grew. And I realized that if I wanted to 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 do more for a person, then I'm going to have to learn more. I'm going to have to get educated, mm -hmm. and and you know, and I did. So you know, I would still still had to support my family, my you know, my 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 lifestyle, and pay for education and and pay for marketing. Uh, I did uh, a lot of seminars that I organized, you know, myself and. And uh, newspaper uh, things and mailers and uh, in fact I, I wrote the mailers and there are companies a lot of companies but well, one in particular just copied me and I couldn't do anything about it I wish I would have gotten a little piece of what they did but <laughs> at any rate <clears throat> now where did I learn all that I learned it in the corporate world I learned you know how to use uh, color and copy and 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 wording and I and I just position things. Uh, so that I could get 
the person that's looking at this to look at the right thing and have it talk to them. It's a lot right. of fun. I still enjoy it. It's still fun. Yeah, yeah get there. Yeah. So anyway, from there, I, I just, uh, you, you, you grow both in confidence and, and in being able to deal with larger and larger and larger type of type of clients mm -hmm. so that, you know, you, you know what you're talking about and you're going to lead them certainly in the right, you know, in the right direction. Sure. And uh, I've, I've built this uh, book of business and all the different transactions. As I mentioned to you earlier, it's not all about assets under management. It, it all starts with, you know, the, the individual, the person or the couple. And I'd have like a three or four hour conversation with them about what is important to them. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you listen, you listen and you learn. And people have always um, shared with me and they've, they've talked with me and I've kind of jokingly said, they tell me things sometimes I wish that I didn't know, but, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, but still you need to know so that you can, so that you can help them. Uh, and, uh, but I mean, nobody ever told me anything that was, that was really bad, you know, nothing, certainly nothing criminal or anything like that, but, you know, you get to know people and you get to, you hear things about the family and so forth and all. And, and uh, it's been rewarding because uh, of all the different transactions that I do with with each each individual or each family. They're, they're mostly families, couples. Uh, they've involved a lot of interesting things. Uh, during the conversation with one of my clients, I learned that they had a little at the time they had a little new grandbaby, and it was a little girl with Down syndrome. And they told me a, a number of things. I don't want to get into it right now, but a number of things which I said, well, based on what you're you, you're sharing with me. I think what you what you what we really ought to do is set up a special needs trust. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned to you earlier, a, a, a dear friend of mine and a great buddy, and we've worked together. He's a estate planning attorney, and we've worked together since like 2005. So I got Jack involved and and um, uh, told him what they want to do and and so forth. And so he put together the special needs trust along with you know a lot of other legal things you know that we did. But that was pretty cool. And they funded, uh, you know, that trust to that little girl. And she's now 16, 17 years old. Uh, it's amazing how time flies. But that's just uh, kind of an example of what I do. Because when I talk to people, they talk back. And I've right. been able to do a lot of things like that. Uh, my heart is, is into giving. That's the reason I did the CAP thing. And that has been also fulfilling and rewarding, not only for me, but for the, you know, the, the people. Um, oh, sure. And, it, it, you know, there's so many people, particularly business owners and particularly business owners that have made it on their own. You know, they, they understand giving back and right. they want to. They just don't know how. I mean, there's a thing you probably remember, you, you know, what checkbook philanthropy is, you know. I mean, they're, they're great at writing checks when there's a tsunami or whatever, but right. but you'll you'll find that they want to do more, you know, a lot more, and they don't want the credit for it. They don't want their name plastered up on the side of a building, you know. Right. And the the tech, the Internal Revenue Code has a lot to say about that. There's so much you can do if you know it, right? And, uh, and, I, and I've learned it, so you know. So, so uh, Rick, you you design you know, kind of just individual gifts or plans, long term philanthropic plans for. Oh yeah, yeah. I, uh, oh, I yeah, I could tell you a whole lot of the different things that I've done in that area. The, um, but I work uh, with businesses as well as individuals, and in, you know, in their giving, um, the you know, business owners have no idea because their CPA or their advisors aren't talking to them. What's really funny though is, I, I think. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think in the, there's so many advisors out there that shy away from this. They don't want to talk about it. Right. And yet the, the, uh, like a, a business owner or, or, you know, they do. And, and it's funny when you get them engaged in the conversation, boy, they just, they just take off. Yeah. So I would to all these people that you reach out to, I would say, Hey, you're, you are missing not only uh, a, a, an opportunity to do to, to feel good and do good for somebody, you're missing out on a ton of business. You know, a yeah. lot of new assets under management, a lot of life insurance that I use for wealth replacement. Um, it's incredible. Well, in the surveys, I'll show that if you talk to your client about philanthropy, 
and, and philanthropic planning, those clients will move more money to you. And that, that, that bears out with what mm-hmm. people say, what happens in reality. But many financial advisors are busy trying to just collect assets and they don't want to give money away. They want to get money. But when you give more, you might get more as well. Right. Oh, so for sure. sure. Yeah. 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 You figure yeah, that sure. out. Um, it's doing what I do at, uh, in the growing stage is, 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 is pretty hard. You, you, you know, like you mentioned, advisors, AUM, I mean, that's their agenda. They really don't have any time to do anything else. They got to live. Well, so did I. Uh, and you know, it's just been a blessing from above that 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 I've been able to to do what I've done, uh, and you know, never be in debt and and never run short during the months uh, and all. Right. But I am able to provide uh, a lot of different services to uh, an individual, family, or or business. Nice, in- including you know, tax reduction. I. You know, that's been interesting because that has opened the door to a lot of other transactions. When, and, and you mentioned your comments about your IRS compliance strategies. And let's talk a little bit about that, because that's not something I hear from many financial advisors. What is an IRS compliance strategy as it relates to how you work with folks? Best example, uh, and there's several, the best example would be uh, being compliant where you can move qualified money to non-qualified money and reduce taxes at the same time and uh, create two things, create tax-free retirement income and leave significantly more to the beneficiaries income tax-free. Hmm, nice. So there are uh, financial products to use with that and then there are uh, rules IRS rules that you, uh, you know, uh, certainly abide by in order to accomplish that. Um, it's also getting, uh, getting more knowledge under uh, the Pension Protection Act of 2006 when uh, Bush was president. He, he signed that into law. I mean, that is just chock full of ways to create a personalized retirement plan that would involve not only just the salary deferral 401k, but you can have a safe harbor, a profit sharing plan, a pension plan, a 401h account, uh, as well as life insurance. And you put all those together and you're looking at really significant contributions and income tax deductions. Some of what you can do that's in the, in the code, believe it or not, is, is um, um, uh, uh, discriminatory, but it's, but it's legal. But you got to know the rules. You got to know how to how to how to set that up. Um, yeah. But but so that's that's a lot of fun. It's interesting and, and it's very rewarding, both financially and individually. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like you you know again, this the fiduciary sense doing the best thing you can for the client, and it, it makes you feel good as well when you do the right thing for a family. You really do. Yeah. 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 So Rick, you you mentioned four hundred one H. And I'm not sure many of our listeners have heard of, um, obviously everyone's heard of 401k. Tell us a little bit about 401h and how you build that into your practice. Uh, it's, it's actually what it is. It's, it's a section of the Internal Revenue Code, just like 401k. That's where we get 401k, you know. So 401h is, is a section of the code and it has to deal, has to do with, a, with tax-free reimbursement of out-of-pocket healthcare expenses during retirement. So in other words, a uh, person retires, they got Medicare, uh, and let's say they buy a, a supplemental policy. So you got that 80-20. Uh, but there's a lot of other things that are not covered uh, that, the, uh, that the IRS al- uh, allows. In fact, when you go into the IRS website, you can read a lot uh, about that particular section and get into all the different things that they will allow you to uh, take out of an account once you're retired to pay f- pay for that are health related. Um, so it, it, I have numbers on, on I mean, they're, they're, it's staggering how much out of pocket expense retirees will have even if they live to their life expectancy, it's pretty high. So a 401H can be part of the defined benefit plan where they are actually making contributions into the into the 401h account that are tax deductible 
And then that money is growing because it's invested. So there you have for all, all, all those guys that, that gals that love the assets under management, there you go, because they can put a lot of that uh, uh, you know, away and uh, uh, you know, you're gonna be in, investing it. So that when they, uh, when they do retire, then and they have an expense that's not going to be covered by, you know, uh, they 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 go in and they take that money out income tax free. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's really something it really is, and I think all of us know that the 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 health insurance business or the health care in this country is is just horrible, it leaves a lot to be desired, and it's not going to get any better. Um, when you think about that. Think about a 401h account, you're 68 or 70 years old, and uh, you would really prefer to use a particular surgeon or a particular, I don't know, whatever, and say it's not going to be covered. Well, you could go into that account and uh, and get it paid for. So I think it's uh, also some good, you know, good pre-planning, you know, for better health care down the road. Sure. It's interesting. We, we talked earlier um, <clears throat> You know about about some of those other strategies, and then you have about two hundred client families. You know different levels, A, B, C, kind mm -hmm. of uh, as, as most financial advisors do. Um, but then you mentioned to me about a, a couple of clients. We talked about uh, a gentleman. We'll we'll call him James. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a self-made man in the upholstery business. And uh, so, how did that all develop? And he's still alive. But he's ninety-eight years old. Uh, <laughs> how did you? Yeah. How him and how did that relationship develop? I actually met him through uh, uh, going back to about 1995 or something like that. I met I met they're Charles. Really, yeah, really yeah. Good. I, I met Charles through um, uh, an insurance agent, and uh, I don't know. I didn't I didn't take him away. I just there were things that that I could talk to Charles about that you know he couldn't. So one thing led to another. In fact, it wasn't a year or two. I think after that that the the, the man. A young man too uh, passed away, so I just continued working with uh, you know with Charles and uh, and his wife. You know, uh, her name was Dorothy. Dorothy passed away. I think it's been three years now, three or four years. Right. And uh, February of that year, they celebrated their seventieth wedding anniversary, cool. and uh, it was in May that Dorothy passed away. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Charles is still. You know he's he's still not good, he's but, but, well, you, but you all types of different services. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I did a lot of lot of different types of transactions, and I've got other members of the family, you know, as as clients uh, as well that are multi transactional, family based. And then you also met a lady, a trust fund lady, through through him as well, and how that all developed, like the referral. Oh. Oh, well, yeah, no, she didn't turn out to be a, a client. I was kidding, just kind of telling you a story of the kind of work that Charles and, and, and his company, uh, you know, did, which is, which is sure. really interesting. Uh, but as far as other types of clients, um, I was, uh, I, I actually, some of my best clients came through veterinary medicine. And many, many, many years ago, uh, I decided to, you know, to, target veterinarians. And the reason I did is because I'm an animal lover. Uh, you saw my horse, my picture. I'm a horse nut, but <laughs> you know, but I but I love all, all animals. <clears throat> Pardon me. And but I also learned that and saw that veterinarians, you know, very, very bright people, um, they're they're so kind. Most of them are, are just really down to earth and, and a pleasure to work with. They don't have nose problems, you know, a lot of them don't. <laughs> so I just, <clears throat> pardon me. So I really enjoyed it, and I got involved with the uh, Texas Veterinary Medical Association, and I put together seminars and things, and uh, where uh, uh, you know they would come in, and and uh, back then I don't know now, but I mean back back then this is like 10, 15 years ago. People, uh, I mean advisors, they didn't have an advisor. And you have to understand that that veterinarians no they don't the, they don't make as much money as as a, as a doctor. In fact, they um, uh, they the, a lot of them will have a little saying. It's kind of cute, you know. The instead of MD, it's RD. You know, uh, an MD is actually an RD, a real doctor. You know, <laughs> we're just we're veterinarians. <laughs> but 
you know, they, uh, a, a good veterinarian practice today, uh, you know, a veterinarian will, will pull anywhere from three to 600,000 or so in, you know, mm-hmm. in uh, a gross income. Uh, so many of them do have a lot of debt because people have demanded a lot of veterinarians now. They got to have the nice building. They got to have all of the equipment and everything, which is pretty expensive, you know. But from there is where some of my other fantastic clients have come from that, uh, uh, you know, that are wealthy and, you know, they are involved in uh, oil and gas and real estate and, and just a lot of multi uh, uh, type things, restaurants and so forth. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, you know, just, just hearing you talk, uh, Rick, you know, the way you've developed your practice and the different types of families you work with, you really focused on solutions and people and how to make solutions work for them. And, you know, as we said earlier, uh, the records say your LPL, they say you have about 90 million there, but we've never really focused on that. We focused on on what kind of solutions you're bringing in. You know, there's insurance out there, there's trails on funds, there's all kinds of different things that are part of it. So so rather than focusing on only on AUM, uh, maybe the best strategy from what I'm hearing from you could be that we focus on the client and go wherever we need to go, whether it's mm-hmm. philanthropy, mm-hmm. corporate insurance, personal insurance, maybe uh, selecting money managers, financial planning, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or anything that they need. Um, what are some of the other uh, things we haven't discussed that you've done? I mean, the, 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 I've never heard funeral insurance as a practice. It's fascinating. What else, what else is uh, in your toolkit? Um, well, I, I go kind of above, above and beyond because uh, help. Uh, now, I use obviously an attorney, my good friend Jack. But, you know, uh, I'll help them in, in, in planning where, you know, we'll, we'll need to set up some uh, limited liability companies mm-hmm. um, okay. and some different kinds of trust and things like that. I, I help uh, when, when you got it like a, like a, a multi-transactional plan and there's a lot of life insurance. I mean, I, I do have a lot of life insurance in my, in my book. And I know that, that, you know, when I sell my quote unquote book, it, it's like the insurance doesn't count for anything, but I got news for you. You know, the, the, the guy, I do have someone in mind that uh, maybe in a year or two, Lord willing, I don't know. I mean, he would like nothing more than to, uh, you know, to purchase it. And he's in, in fact, uh, Jeff knows some of my my clients. They know him. It could be a very good fit. But he's what he's going to also get is millions and millions and millions of dollars of life insurance that might not have his name on it, but it's got their name on it. Right. And when, when, you know, when finally, when the death claim comes then Jeff is going to be, you know, the guy that's, that's going to be able to, uh, you know, do whatever needs to be done with a $2 million policy or, you know, something like that. Right. Uh, so with that though, I do talk to people. Um, I, I kind of like plant seeds, you know, words are seeds and mm-hmm. I, and I plant seeds and I say, think about this grandchildren and great grandchildren. We all know that, you know, their tendency is they want a lump sum distribution. They're going to go buy that fancy Camaro or whatever it is, (laughs) you know. (laughs) So rather than. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And and so I tell us, I say, look, I'm not trying to get you to quote rule from the grave, but think about, you know, the the vast amount of tax free money that's going to be available and these are younger people. You might want to think about, you know, how we plan to set up some kind of trust or something so that they just don't squirrel it away, you know, blow it, you know. And it's things like that that most advisors uh, that I understand they 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 they're not thinking about. Um, and and it, it's that kind of thing that people really appreciate because they say, you know, haven't thought about that. You're right. Yeah. We need we need to figure that out. You know. Well, and I think Rick also, this also points out possibly for many of our listeners in the Financial Advisor Workshop that, you know, being in the independent space where you have been your whole career and I've been recently in the last decade or so, uh, you have a lot more freedom to do things like that, to create an LLC, to work with another mm-hmm. consultant, to uh, do commercial insurance, to do all kinds of different things that that most financial advisors, you know, their firm, you know, the, you know, the business 
the business interruption department gets in the way. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and they say, no, you can't do that. And you, you're not qualified to do that. And we'll, our lawyers won't, won't allow that and all that. So um, that, that really, to be a full financial advisor with all, every tool in your toolkit, you really have to be independent, don't you? Well, yeah, you do. Uh, one other area that, that I still work in and, and, I, and I market towards uh, uh, are tax qualified plans, uh, mm-hmm. which we've kind of touched on. Because it it allows so many other things to happen, uh, a business owner can be discriminatory can 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 do wonderful things for their rank and file, let's say, but they can also be discriminatory legally, you know, for their key employees and mm-hmm. and, and top execs. Uh, we 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 can by law we can put together a very complex comprehensive plan that allows them to put well over a million dollars away, you know, if it's that, that kind of business, they can afford to do that sort of thing. That That's a, a 100% uh, income, uh, business expense, income tax deduction, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so designing those plans is is really interesting. It's a lot of fun. And I get, I get help on that because that's a world that, that you really got to have a specialist in because you're dealing with the IRS, the, the DOL, and whoever else, you know, right? And right. The, you know, the guy that I work with has been doing it for for thirty, forty years, and keeps up with all the laws and changes and what. And and you know, he and I think alike in terms of the way we work with people. Because what I'll I'll do, I'll, I'll go to John. I'll say, okay, John, here's the deal. This is what they want to do. And then, of course, you know, you've got all the you know the 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 employee census and all the details and stuff like that. And based on my input to him is how he will help design the plan. And then we just, you know, implement it. Nice. But it's, uh, it, it's uh, I'll tell you, uh, most, most of the time, we are able to reduce federal income taxes, I mean, substantially, and sometimes down to zero. So if you can imagine doing that, I mean, sometimes for a lot of these people, that's a, a high five or six figure tax savings. Sure. So that's, that's money they get to keep. And they can do whatever they want with that money, you know. Right. So that's that's a lot of fun. That's enjoyable too. Yeah, and it's so rewarding to do all this great work and unique work. Um, hey, Rick. Um, question for our listeners: How has, in your view, the industry changed over the last thirty years? I've seen you. We've heard your progression. Um, is it different than it was thirty years ago? The industry. Um, well, there's a lot more uh, of course product innovation you mm-hmm. know which is which has been terrific i mean mm-hmm. that, you know that's really been really been helpful um and of course nowadays especially the last five years or so um innovations using technology you know computers there's <clears throat> so much that, that that you can do in terms of marketing in terms of reaching out um <clears throat> give you an example so i'm dealing with allergies today um Way back when, if 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 I wanted to reach out to a high profile person, whether it be like a physician or a doctor or a very successful uh, business owner or something like that, I mean, there was a, a thousand gatekeepers. You know, you just, you know, even the strong referral sometimes was difficult to get in to, to see the guy, right? Right. Well, it's so it's it's crazy now because I can use that tool that. LinkedIn has, and I can uh, I can target a CEO. Well, put it this way: I can get CEOs, physicians, surgeons. I can get people to get back in touch with me within 24 hours. Nice. That's the big difference between years ago, where I couldn't do that. Right. You know, but only I can if now. only if the message is right. Well, for sure. Yeah, I mean, they're obviously smart people and very busy people, and they're not going to, you know, just answer everything. But what what I send out to them is not only a, a, attracting, but it's like, really, I need to I need to learn more about that. So, it, it you know, we'll set up a phone call, just a 15-minute call, and that's how it all starts. Nice. So you work with top people, and you know ways to target them that they'll be interested in. Mm-hmm. And- Compared to most yeah. people shooting blanks all over the place, and not not connecting. Yeah. Well, I, I've never, you know, I've always 
been different, you know. Um, financial advisor, if you tell somebody or if you advertise yourself as a financial advisor, you might as well advertise yourself as a, as a dry cleaner. So, I mean, there's a dry cleaner on every corner. Well, there's right. a financial advisor on every corner, for goodness sakes. And, and so what makes you different than, I mean, that's what they're thinking. Right. Uh, you know, they're thinking, okay, well, oh, come on, another advisor. And they just, you know, but so you've got to stand out. You've got to, to uh, approach and reveal something that is close to their heart and something that they need and they or they need to understand and yes. then you're not an advisor anymore you're actually a confidant you're someone that's gonna that's gonna give them some information that's gonna be really beneficial for them right and they hear financial advisor they think salesman or something like that but you show them something unique and you're part uh-huh. of the inner, your inner team right yeah, yeah exactly yeah it's not the awesome. easiest thing in the world to do but right. it, it's what you know it only takes one I mean, as I mentioned to you, some of these life cases, you know, are six-figure commissions. I mean, right. you know, if you want to do five or ten of those a year, you can. Uh, you know, do the math. You want to make over a million a year, you know, you certainly can. You have, you have the tools. You've got the laws. Now, just go apply it. You know, exactly. How big? A, how big is your team? Is it? Is it just you? Or do you have? It's just me. Always has been, man. Yeah. You know, my my wife has always done our our, our taxes, and she's I'm, you know very skilled at that and all. But um, you know, there was a time that I officed in quote downtown with with a group, uh, and the really the the association was because th- was through the broker dealer, and I was officing downtown for about eight years. But you know, I never really, I never, well, no, I didn't get any new clients from them, but but we, I don't know, I, you know, was able to share their space, their their conference rooms, and and I mean, we had a good friendship, of course, and things like that. But still, it's always been me, myself, and I, all three of us. <laughs> <laughs> so but it's you want mano a mano, you and that one wealthy investor, um, and you listen and you design ideas, and then you show them what they need to do. It's great. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is what our industry was meant to be. Oh, I, I think it was. I mean, I, I know that there's people out there that that they only do one thing. And, and I think that's good. If, if you want to be a life insurance expert, that is uh, extremely rewarding. Uh, and it can be, I mean, I know life agents that make well over a million dollars a year. But, and that's mm-hmm. all they do. They don't care about anything else. You know, yes. that, that's what they do, but they fill a need, you know, they, you know, they obviously do. So, uh, but I never, I guess I didn't, my mind never th- thought like that. I, I don't think of just like one, one, one skill set, let's say. Yeah. It's such a broad platform and uh, it's really a unique, Rick. Uh, well, it, it's, uh, it's really great to hear um, you and talk with you about how you build your practice and, it's very unique uh, in, in the practices that we've spoken to. So I, I think everybody on the financial advisor workshop is going to be all the better for having heard this discussion and, you know, back and forth uh, uh, review. Um, pretty, pretty fascinating. So Rick, I'm, I'm hoping that we can get an update with you maybe again in the future, maybe sure, sure. on the line and just hear what, what the latest is going on with you and, and your practice and how, our advisors can build with wealthy families in really a unique, unique way like you've done. Well, uh, yeah, and I told you what I'm going to be in my birthday coming up this year, which is... August, you're going to be 70. (laughs) Happy birthday. Oh, yeah. 70. It's like I told you. It's like, no, no, I'm not. My dad or my granddad is 70, (laughs) not me. I'm still, I'm 25. (laughs) Uh, and I say that because I'm not, I don't know what I'm going to do with, you know, with things here, maybe a year or two, just keep the book and all and maybe, and sell it. Uh, I don't, I don't know what, the, what, what the future holds yet, okay. but I do know that I'm past my time. My time is, is done. Now there's generations behind me and they're, you know, it's, it's time. You know what I mean? 